And this, th th this will serve as an introduction. Um, I'm not going to read it to you. I put it up here so that everybody could read it and then we could go on to the next slide. And so it's a, you know, a time-saving device on my part. And I, I will tell you one thing. I am not known for brevity. On the other hand, I, before I give a talk, I always listen to a Mozart symphony, hopefully for the Mozart effect. But I've only got something like 10 minutes now, so i got to hurry. <laughs> that said, Green is down here in the southwestern part of the state, and this is the Colorado Mineral Belt. There have been a lot of questions that have been brought to the surface about the Colorado Mineral Belt fairly recently, but the one thing you cannot deny about it is that with the exception of three districts, everything of economic significance is in that belt. And everything that's of economic significance that's outside of that belt is tied directly to volcanic activity. So, take it for what it, what it is. And I am not going to be focusing today on geology, but I can't get away from just trying to point out a couple of, of small things, and that is that the, the Creed Mining District sits in this area outlined in red. And those black lines are faults, and those have been mineralized, so now we call them veins. And the green marks the boundaries of the Bachelor Caldera. And we're going to get into that next time. And just leave it alone for right now. This is a cross section across the veins. And the ones that are truly important for our purposes in going through the mining history are first the amethyst and then the P vein and the OH vein and the Bulldog Mountain vein, we'll talk about that next week. And we'll mention this one over here, the Solomon Holy Moses, and we'll mention this one, but they're not of great significance to us this afternoon. And this is a cross-sectional view and it's showing you an igneous intrusion down here that had something to do with the uh, eruptions in the uh, eastern and middle portion of the San Juan volcanic field. But when this area collapsed, forming a caldera, these are the faults that enable the down dropping to actually occur. And over on this side, we've got the amethyst and the OH is here and the P so close to it that they didn't bother to show it. And the Bulldog Mountain is here and there's the Alpha Corsair. So with that introduction, I'm going to pretty much walk away from the geology other than to point out in this oblique aerial photo, all of this has actually been outlined and here is the amethyst vein system the OH and the P, the Bulldog, the Alpha Corsair, and the Solomon um, Holy Moses. And topographically what we're really concerned with is this area right in here. This is Willow Creek draining down from the mountains and at this point Willow Creek splits. And this is West Willow and this is East Willow and those are the areas in which most of the important mining actually occurred for our purposes today. Um, there's a great deal of activity on Bulldog Mountain, but that's for later. This man, J.C. McKenzie, showed up in the area around 1885, and it's a little bit difficult to tell exactly when Mr. McKenzie showed up about 1885. 
and he prospected in the area of where the Alpha Corsair vein was, and then he prospected in some of the other areas, and he actually staked a claim in this little prospect on the Alpha Corsair, and he tried to mine it. Um, he was successful in getting mineral out of the ground, but he could, didn't have any way to ship it. And this revolves directly around uh, one of the key points well, uh, showing how mining is integral or integrally, inter integrally involved with all of these other parts of civilization and, and one of those is transportation and that's a big deal. Uh, if you can't move your material then you might as well forget it. So the Alpha Corsair was pretty much of a failure. He also staked a claim on top of Bachelor Mountain and he called it the Bachelor Claim, and it comes into play later on. But he did not do anything with it in these early days. And the next guy that shows up is Nicholas Creed, except that's not really his name. Uh, apparently he was going through an alimony lawsuit in Los Angeles, and he was trying to hide from his ex-wife and he adopted this as a pseudonym. Uh, at any rate, the name sort of stuck, although apparently he spelled it a couple of different ways uh, through time. Uh, it, at some points in time, he would forget to put the E on the end of it, and so there are records that actually show Creed spell C-R-E-E-D. But Nicholas Creed actually had been prospecting in the Lake City area across the uh, the, the divide to the north and he was trying to follow what he thought was perhaps a promising vein system and he came across the divide and came down East Willow Creek and this is East Willow and this is West Willow and way up here at the top it says Holy Moses someplace. I can't read it, but I'm at a, at a goofy angle. And Nicholas Creed staked his claim, and supposedly, now there's several different versions of the quote, he said as he was digging in the hillside, Holy Moses, and then he either said, look at the mineral, or he said chloride of silver, or he said, look at the silver. But apparently what he was in fact identifying was the mineral chlorargyrite, which is silver chloride. And silver chloride is one of these unique prospecting tools if you're actually looking for silver. It is one of the most nondescript things that you could possibly imagine. And it's, it, it was also called horn silver by the early miners and also by the early geologists. And it looks kind of like a chunk of cow's horn. And like a chunk of cow's horn, you can pull out your knife and you can cut it. It's, it's what we call sectal. And that's a very distinctive thing. It isn't that it splinters or breaks. You can actually slice it. And you find old specimens in collections that have cuts all over it. In fact, we've got one on display in the museum that somebody sawed into with a hacksaw. And somebody asked me why we were putting it out, and I said, yeah, but this is diagnostic for the time. I mean, this, this is what people did. Because they could do it, they did do it, that doesn't make it a good idea. At any rate, he said one of these things, but the Holy Moses part stuck. And so the claim gets named the Holy Moses. Now, as it turns out, the ore body was actually kind of small. But they produced enough silver that it got some people interested. And you can see that this is not a major mining property. I mean, that's you know like a little log cabin that's just backed up and they've got some diggings on the inside so that they can do this in stormy weather and in the winter. And today, um, that cabin is gone. That, that same trail is still there. Um, and you can tell from the topography, you're there, but when you get over into this area, you look around and go, you know, what, what, what on earth was it that caused this guy 
to stop and dig there. Probably something like discolorization of the country rock. At any rate, this is the only piece of chlorargyrite that I have ever seen from Crete. And it's what we call a micro-mineral specimen, which means that you need a microscopic view in order to be able to appreciate it. Now, there are those of us who might say, I'm not sure how much appreciation can actually be done on something that's this small. But this specimen is in the Harvard Museum collection. And I wish that I had a better picture of it, but when I went to Harvard to go photograph, um, I wasn't counting on having to photograph a micro-specimen. I'd already looked through their catalog, and I said, I want you to pull 5623. And Carl Francis said, sure. And he pulled out this little bitty box, and I said, you're kidding me, Carl. I came all the way <laughs> to Massachusetts <laughs> to photograph this thing, and so we tried to do it. And it's got wire silver. Those things are wires of silver, and it's those brown blobs that are completely and totally ugly that are chlorargyrite. And wish I could show you something better, but this is all that there is. There was chlorargyrite in lots and lots of mining districts all over the world. It was an important ore. In Bolivia, the Spanish discovered that you could just sort of stick a candle flame under it, and if you didn't breathe real hard so that you didn't inhale the chlorine, you could smelt it right there with a candle flame, and you end up with this chunk of silver. Anyway, that's what the excitement was all about. There were other minerals that were minerals that were from the, quote, oxidized zone, and that means that these are things that have been exposed to weathering processes, and they have chemically altered Cerucite is lead carbonate, and it has been weathered from the primary sulfide galena, which is lead sulfide, and this is a normal weathering phenomenon, and this is another small specimen that is from the Holy Moses mine. There's not a whole lot that is left from this particular location. And this is a specimen of anglocyte, and this is lead sulfate. And that's probably the best anglocyte crystal uh, from Colorado that is in existence. Uh, it's about an inch and a quarter in diameter, and that is huge for Colorado. But this was the stuff that also caught everybody's imagination. And those are wires of silver, and that's a typical habit in which silver is found in nature on a very rusty quartz matrix. All of this sort of knobby looking stuff are little bitty crystals of quartz. And from, from top to bottom, uh, that's probably four inches across. And so this is a nice blob of wire silver. It has not been cleaned. And this is the way that you would find it in the near surface. So this guy got interested. His name's David Moffat. He'd already made a fortune in mining with his partner Jerome Chaffee, the senator, uh, in Leadville beginning in 1879. They had been involved uh, at Caribou in Boulder County, and they had their fingers in pies involved in various mines all across the state. Uh, by this point in time, he was the president of the Denver and Rio Grande Railroad. He was also the vice president of one of the banks in Denver. I guess it was First National Bank of Denver, although I'm not sure they were calling that at, that at that time. And Dave Moffat was a very astute businessman. And he talked with Nicholas Creed and decided that he would like to become involved in this new discovery. And so in 1891, he buys the Holy Moses, but Nicholas Creed remains a partner in it. And furthermore, Moffat has to sit behind a desk all day. And so he said, you know, that's not all. He said, you know, I'm, I, I'm, I'm willing to let you have a major chunk of this operation, and what I want you to do is prospect for me. And it'll be under contract, but you get to be one of the claim holders on anything that you find. 
And so he turns the guy that's had the most success in that area out into the hills again looking for things, and that actually happens. Now, Moffat is a pretty sharp businessman, and he goes to the next board meeting of the Denver and Rio Grande Railroad, and he says, we have a daily train that comes into Wagon Wheel Gap. That's something like 15 miles away from this area. We should extend the track down. I'm convinced that there is mineralization there, and we'll make a whole lot of money on freight and passenger service. And the board of directors said, nope, not going to do it. So he said, OK, um, I'll build it. And when I get good and ready, I'll sell it back to you. And by the way, I also resign as president. You can all <coughs> go jump in a lake. <laughs> so he does that. He finances it. It cost him approximately seventy-five thousand dollars, which is, you know, three quarters of a million in today's money, maybe more. And in December of 1891, the railroad pulls into town, and this becomes a major deal for several reasons. The first one is the Creed Ores are occurring in veins that have a whole lot of silica. That one that's called the amethyst vein, that's literally amethyst. That is the main mineral in addition to all of the metallics that are there. And in these days when you want to smelt ore, what you have to do is make up this, what they call a furnace charge, and you put the ore in the furnace and you have to calculate out what you're doing when you do this, because different materials melt in different ways. And silica in the ore acts as a flux. And that doesn't mean it makes it easier for the melt it to melt. What it means is that it makes it less viscous. And so it'll flow. And so you melt this stuff down. The silver, being heavier than the silica, sinks to the bottom of the container, and you pour off all of the silica at the top, and you're left with silver down at the bottom. You've also got lead that's mixed in, it, in with it and other things, but this is really a very simple process if you have a melt that's not too viscous. And the smelters at Leadville were primarily dealing with the lead ores of Leadville, and they were viscous, and so they were constantly having to add silica to their or charge, and if they could buy this stuff from Creed that contained silver and it had enough silica to facilitate the, uh, the lowering of viscosity, then this is a real bonus and they were willing to pay a premium. So the railroad pulls into town and it's shipping ore almost immediately. Um, it's also bringing in two passenger trains a day from Denver. and. I'm not quite sure what to make of this picture. Um, it is entirely possible that this is just like the trains in India that you see today, where these guys are paying you know, one third of the normal ticket price and riding from Denver to Creed on the roof of the train. Uh, it could also be that there are some cars over here, Pullman cars, that they're renting out on one of the siding as uh, your handy dandy motel. And which it is, I don't really know, but this is the arrival of a train in Crete. And that's happening twice a day. People are pouring into the district. And the ore is going out. In the meantime, Nicholas Creed has been prospecting in the hills, and there are a couple of guys who were up at the top of this hill up in this area, and they have found mineralization. Now, they're over now in West Willow Creek, and the mineralization is really quite promising. It's a lot more prominent. It looks like things could really take off. And these guys 
are arguing between themselves about where they should put their claim boundaries. And every morning he gets up and he goes over to their tent and he says, you guys made up your mind yet? Well, no, we just, we just don't know where to put this last marker. Well, try and get it done by noon. <laughs> and this goes on for a couple of days and he finally comes in and says, I'm going to stake over you if you don't do it. So they get busy, they locate their claim, and he immediately goes right on to the end of the thing and he stakes the amethyst claim. Theirs is called the last chance. Some people say it's because they were down on their luck, they were down on their money, and this was their last chance. But it may be that Nicholas Creed said, this is your last chance, guys. Get the job done. At any rate, they stake the claim that has that mine on it, and immediately adjacent is the amethyst claim. And these are early views. This is like 1893. So, suddenly you have places that have abundant mineral that is ready to be shipped, and Moffitt's Railroad fits right into this pattern. Today, the amethyst is still a recognizable feature. This is actually a photograph probably from around uh, 1900, and it's been hand-colored. It's not really a color photograph. And this is a mill site that has been built, and these spires are common in lots of the Creed area, but the last chance is up here on that part of the hillside. And today, this, these are the portals that have been driven into the adits. At Creed, everybody calls them tunnels. They're not really tunnels. A tunnel is something that goes all the way through the hill and has an opening on either end. This only goes in and goes to the vein, so they're adits. Um, but that is the number two level of the amethyst, and there are one, two, three, four, five different levels for the amethyst vein system. And this is the way that that scene looks today. This is where that mill was located that was in that hand-colored photograph. And these are the more modern features of the surface plant. This is an enormous mine dump. And they're far enough up the canyon that they got to get the ore down, and so they load it onto burrows to bring it down to the train station below. And this is a slow and arduous process, but the ore is rich enough that they still can make a go of doing this. And all the time, David Moffat is counting that money out, <laughs> and Nicholas Creed is counting his money out, and so are the guys at the last chance. Um, these are the boroughs actually loading onto the railroad car. The, the train did come up the canyon a ways. And from there, uh, it gets loaded and shipped off to Denver. Uh, it's uh, not to Denver, to uh, Leadville. It's essentially a one, two-day trip at most. And this is the last chance, now taken from above. And this is the amethyst, and this is the happy thought, and that's essentially the end of the productive area of the, the length of the amethyst vein. And the last chance is a very unusual exposure of the vein. Um, the main ore mineral in these upper zones was silver chloride, the chlorargyrite, and native silver. And that is leaves. This thing has been sliced. It's on display in the museum. And this is a slab of rock, and these are three-dimensionally leaves, like this, all at different angles, and it's been sliced so they're, they're appearing as, as blades, but that's not what they are. And this is banded agate, which is the whitish material, and banded amethyst. Both of them are silicon dioxide. They're both quartz minerals. Just the amethyst is <coughs> what we call purple quartz, and crypto-crystalline quartz is, is the white stuff, the chalcedony. And that's the way the ore looked. 
and you can read the old time descriptions of people watching the ore come out of the mine in the ore carts and in the sunlight, it's sparkling purple crystals, just incredibly beautiful stuff, Un unlike anything that, that, that we've actually ever seen in any of the American mining districts of the West. And this guy is offered a chance to buy part of the holdings of the last chance because mining is capital intensive up front. You have to go through all of the development stuff at first before you can actually get anything out of the ground and then you get, it, get it shipped someplace and receive money for it. And his name is Ed Walcott and he's a U.S. Senator. And he actually knows Jacob Sanders, who was one of the five guys that bought out the two prospectors that had such a hard time making up their mind where to stake their claim. There's, there, there are five guys who now are involved in the thing, and Jacob Stan Sanders says, well, i got a friend, Senator Walcott, who has some money, and we could sell him some of this, and we'd raise the money to be able to continue mining until we can actually get our cash flow worked out. And he says, absolutely, I am, I am on board. And they all turn out becoming quite wealthy. <laughs> now, as it turns out, Ed Walcott was so grateful, because they made over a million dollars in that first year, that he turned back around and had a platter manufactured, custom manufactured by silversmiths um, back east, and he had a pitcher manufactured to go with it. And the platter is actually engraved, and there's no way I could get the light to actually work right so you could read the Gothic script. But this is what is, it is engraved with. And this is one of the real treasures that we have in the Geology Museum. It was donated to us back in the 1980s. And the, the story involved in it is, is a little bit strange, but this is the way the world of antiquities works. Um, a guy was a collector of Colorado material, and he owned, I mean, he, he had a big enough collection that he regularly paid a visit to an antique store in Indianapolis where he lived. And he had a friend named Bob Nye, who was from the Front Range here, and Bob Nye was visiting him one Christmas. And this guy owns the antique store, and he calls his friend, and he says, uh, where, is, where is Greed, Colorado? <laughs> <laughs> and the guy said, I haven't got the foggiest idea. Bob, do you know where Greed, Colorado is? No, no, I don't know. Well, you ought to come over and look at this thing anyway. It says it's from Greed, Colorado. And <laughs> what it is is that other spelling of Nicholas Creed's name without the E on the end of it, but the Gothic C looks enough like a Gothic G that it would be easy to make that mistake. And... As a result, they figure out that this is something that they really ought to buy. It's apparently in pretty bad shape, and its companion piece is this silver pitcher. And that thing is over a foot high. Uh, and those are street scenes in Crete. And you can look at the photographs and see that it's an extraordinarily accurate rendition. So they buy this, this stuff, bring it back, they call Kirk and Sons, who has been merged into another company, but talk to the chief metalsmith, and he goes, uh, we would restore it. And they ship it off, and six months later, they get the two things back, and they keep them sitting around the house, and his wife one day says, honey, why don't we give this to the to the museum. It, it, it takes up the space that our grandkids golf trophies go. <laughs> and so they do. And they are, we are presently moving their location within the next couple of weeks. We'll move it to the 
very front in their own separate case, but they are real treasures in the Geology Museum. So, Creed is strung up and down the gulch, and Upper Creed only has room for a railroad track, a very narrow street, and in some places buildings on one side only, and in some places it widens out enough that you can actually have something on the other side. And this is in far Upper Creek. And it gives you sort of a flavor of what the frontier was actually like. You, you've got a hotel, an undertaking, embalming place, and a massage parlor all crammed into one block. Um, typical frontier scene. And this is the start of the boom. And remember, you got two trains coming in every day. Um, a little bit further down the, the canyon, it opens up enough so that now you've got a very narrow street, but you've also got some buildings on, on either side. And this is 1892. This is in the middle of the boom. And when you get down to where it actually comes out of the canyon and you're sort of on the plains, it is a slab and tent town. Um, nothing fancy, but these are people here to do a job, and they're either selling to the guys that are going into the hills every day, or they are the ones going into the hills every day looking for mineralization. Um, Obviously, the streets are crowded, and these are the businessmen trying to figure out, okay, well, where should we send our prospectors out to find something, and who knows what all the rest of them are, but other times, it's even more crowded. And they have their own unique brand of advertising. This was painted on a rock on top of Stony Pass on the way from Silverton across the divide into Creek. Now, I, I had to make up the Jones part of it because I can't remember the name of the drugstore. But this is early day billboard advertising. And it's typical for the time. You just go paint it on the rock. And sometimes I look at the advertising today on billboards and I think we haven't gone that far. Anyway. Obviously, a couple of more trains have come in, but that's midday crowd going up and down the streets of Crete. And it has attracted the full run of humanity. Everything from the entrepreneur to the scientist to the engineer to lots and lots of people further down the chain. And there are also some people that are preying on all of those people. And this is one of the grand denizens of the underworld. His name is Jefferson Randolph Smith, better known as Soapy Smith. He's already made a fortune in Leadville playing the soap game. And he is stepping up to his bar um, actually in Skagway, Alaska in this scene because eventually the people in Creed sort of make it known, well, Mr. Smith, we'd like you to relocate elsewhere. We don't care where, just <laughs> elsewhere. Because they, they'd heard all the kind games. They were tired of investors being chased out of town. They were tired of all the things that were going on. But while he was there, he pretty, pretty well ran the town. And you could stand here and give a lecture on Soapy Smith, but I'll just do one. This is McGinney, and he is the famous petrified man that was supposed that he's made of cast concrete. And somebody supposedly dug him up over someplace on the Rio Grande River, brought him into town, and another guy who was a card sharp and sort of um, part-time person who Soapy didn't get along with um, bought him and then Soapy tried to buy him from that guy and he wouldn't sell it so Soapy and his compadres went over and stole him in the middle of the night and they charged 25 cents a look and Soapy would give lectures on the anthropology of early men 
And somebody said, well, he doesn't really look much like an Indian. So we changed his story and, and started doing lectures on petrified people from the Fremont party. <laughs> and about that time, they began to notice that McGinty, he'd gotten this name now, was kind of deteriorating and flaking <laughs> away. And none of the normal fossil type hints that you would expect on something like this were turning up as pieces chipped off and it looked just like the same stuff and they figured out it was concrete and that was the end of that scam. But it's probably Soapy's best effort in Creed while it lasted. And other guys showed up in town. Bob Ford show, showed up and he's the guy that shot Jesse James in the back and if you saw the movie with Brad Pitt. Uh, he, he played uh, Jesse James and he gets gunned down by Bob Ford. And then it goes to a scene that's the final scene of the movie and it's in Creed, Colorado, except it's spelled without the E on the mm -hmm. end of it. And there were all kinds of people in the theater that were going, they misspelled it, they misspelled it. Well, normally, yeah, except that his name for Nicholas Creed, who didn't have a standard spelling. Anyway, Bob Ford showed up. He had a tent saloon. He was not a particularly likable person. He was not well liked by the citizens of Creed at all. And he got into an argument with Ed O'Kelly, who shot him with both barrels of a double-gauge shotgun. <laughs> Uh, <coughs> pellets entered his brain, pellets cut his carotid artery, pellets cut in his jugular vein, and he plopped over on the floor dead. And everybody turned out to have their picture taken at the saloon. <laughs> um, they're not mourners. They're not celebrating a life. They're just showing up because they're taking a picture. And several days later, this is the funeral, and they're not mourners, they're just there because people are showing up to have their picture taken. And he was buried in the cemetery, and, and this is the, the key point that, that tells you that these aren't mourners. He didn't have a headstone, they just chunked him in the ground. <laughs> and a very fine geologist, Tom Stephen, who did some truly landmark work in Creed was there the day that the mayor decided where Bob Ford's grave was so that they could put a sign up and make it a tourist attraction. And he went out and he wandered around and he looked here and he looked here and he said, that way. And so I assure you that that sign is not at the right place unless it's just absolute luck. But that is another sign of how things are done in Creed. It's, it's always been and still is a little bit different. So, with that in mind, one of the most important famous things that happened in Creed was it was the subject of a poem that is much maligned by famous literary critics, but somebody told me that this had to be a sophisticated talk. <laughs> and so this is my attempt at sophistic sophistication. It's called Creed by Cy Warman. Here's a land where all are equal, of high or lowly birth. A land where men make millions dug from the dreary earth. Here the meek and mild-eyed burrow on mineral mountains feed. It's day all day in the daytime, and there is no night in Creed. The cliffs are solid silver with a wondrous wealth untold, and the beds of running rivers are lined with glittering gold. While the world is filled with sorrows and hearts must break and bleed, it's day all day in the daytime and there is no night in Creek. Now, people have read that and they've said, it's doggerel at best. Um, I'm not going to say that I disagree. And, but they all then say, yeah, but it's describing that nightlife with all the gamblers, with Sophie Smith, with Bob Ford and all that stuff. No, it's not. It's describing those <laughs> dates 
On February 1st, 1892, the Creed Electric and Power Company came into existence. Six days later at 10 p.m., they threw the switch and Creed had electric lights. And it was day all day in the daytime and there wasn't any night at Creed anymore. Now, it gets destroyed in the fire and so they have to redo the thing. But that's actually what there's what Cy Warman is celebrating in the poem. So that is the poet's corner for today. At the time that this happens, we have got a mineral boom that's been going on from the earliest days, and it's sort of just this fortunate circumstance that's based on the fact that the federal government has committed to buying X amount of silver, it's actually specified, every month for the Treasury. And what they're doing is they're coining silver dollars. Now, other coins too, but it's mostly going into the Morgan silver dollar. This is the one that everybody thinks of as the silver dollar from the Old West. And most of those silver dollars are stuck into the treasury. They aren't really released very much because the people in the East want to carry paper money that they can fold up and put in their pockets. People in the West like them, but the East is far more populated. And so silver becomes this unusual thing that's being dealt with. And it's being dealt with by governments all over the world because silver has always been a form of currency going all the way back to the Greeks. But the relationship between silver and gold is unbalanced. It's not a tenuous relationship. There's always one there. And in some places at some time, silver was actually the more valuable of the two metals. But that's not most of the time. And so everybody's always trying to figure out, well, how much silver should be in a gold dollar. And we go through this cycle numerous times. It, it starts with Alexander Hamilton in the Coinage Act of 1890, I mean 1792. And he accepts the Spanish eight reales, which is the predecessor to the silver dollar. About the same size, almost exactly the same weight. And it actually says in that act that that will be the accepted currency, and it was all the way to 1865. Uh, people were trading Spanish reales as a dollar. So that is now being manipulated by Congress. What a surprise. <laughs> And as a result, the price is starting to go down. And at the same time, they are very rapidly mining out the really rich portions of the silver deposits at Crete. And so they have to make advances in technology in order to keep up with being able to mine at a profit. This guy comes to the forefront and says, why don't we just drive one long tunnel, it's really an edit, but he called it a tunnel, the length of the vein, and we can haul everything out. And then we'll process the ore before we ship it off to Leadville. And it'll mean less tonnage shipped, so the price of freight will go down, and as a result, we can keep mining. So he forms the Nelson Tunnel and Mining Company, and that then becomes the key to this tunnel mania that Creed goes through for a number of years. And this is the Nelson Tunnel, and it's driven into the side of the hill, and it goes all the way to the Ameth Amethyst Mine. It's probably to a, two and a half miles back there underground to the amethyst from here. And at the portal of the tunnel then, he constructs a little track. And that's the Nelson Tunnel right there. And 
there's a little railroad track, not full blown, and it comes down to here, and that is the newly constructed Humphrey Mill. And furthermore, these are pretty savvy guys, and they are te they're pushing technology as much as they can possibly push it. And in between the ties, there's actually a, a, a sort of a ditch that is filled by a flume full of water that's draining out of the tunnel, and that's coming right down underneath the track to right there. And this is the ruins of it today. Part of it is still there on the hillside. If you know what you're looking for, it, it suddenly all makes sense. And the tunnel is over here, and the Humphreys Mill was over there. And this is the Humphreys Mill. And that track comes across right here, at, uh, right up there at that level. You can see it, there's sort of a flat surface. And there are some ore chutes and things where they simply can dump the ore that is going to be processed right in here into the top of the mill. And then this track is actually for ore that's rich enough that it doesn't have to go through the mill. And it is loaded onto these rails and the cars come down and they can sack it and put it directly in the train. This is in Upper West Willow Canyon. And then there's one other feature that just shows up as sort of a heavy black line and it goes into this building. And that is a pipe, pipeline. And that's where they're putting the water that's coming through in this flume underneath the track. And it powers a Pelton wheel, which was invented in the 1870s. And this is a wondrous turbine. Um, even in the early days, it operated at something like 87% efficiency, which is just an incredible return. And nowadays, they've got it up in the 90s. They still use these things. And this is a relatively modern one. And this shows you how it works. It's mounted on a stand, and the pipe comes down with the water in it. And they've got this little thing that could go in and out, just like the deal on your hose for the, the power uh, that you can adjust the stream of water coming out of the nozzle of the hose by screwing that thing. Well, that's what this is doing. And the water squirts out, and it hits these buckets. And go back one. You can see that that's a double bucket. And it's got a little division that runs down in the middle. And the water hits directly on that little division, and it separates out the stream of water, and it all splashes to the sides, which means that it doesn't then slow down the turning of the wheel the way that just the old mill wheel would actually do. And, you know, those things are constantly dumping the water out from above and doing all these things that mess up with the, with the efficiency of it. This thing is just pure water impulse from that stream of water that's turning that wheel. And there are places where, uh, on the internet, if you Google Pelton Wheel, uh, there's a museum in California at a mine, and you can watch that thing run in there, and it is truly a remarkable thing. When they turn it on, it's going as fast as you could possibly imagine. But that whole mill was powered by two Pelton wheels. And it was a major, major operation. So much so that this guy, who has now bought the adjoining claim where the tunnels are coming out, not the adjoining claim to the amethyst, but down closer, his name is A.E. Reynolds. And he has looked at it and he says, I think that I better use some high-powered 
machinery and technology to process mild. It's coming out of the Commodore mine and there's a lot of waste and I can probably streamline the processes. Now, A.E. Reynolds is kind of like Moffitt. He's one of these pioneers of Colorado mining and he has stayed up with all of this stuff for years and years and years and years. A smart guy. And in 1899, his mine paid one million dollars in dividends because they streamlined their processes. They built their technology up to absolute up-to-date standards. And for a number of years, the Commodore was one of these same operations that was going so well. And this is, by the way, 1899, after the silver crash, which we haven't quite gotten to yet. So, this is the Commodore Tunnels. And number one is actually around the back. But this is the number two level, the number three, the number four, and then the number five is down here. And when Reynolds dies, his daughter, Anna Reynolds, who is married uh, to Mr. Gary over here, says, well, what are we going to do with this now? Daddy isn't around to actually run it. And they work out a series of leases with this man, Ben Poxon, uh, the short guy right there. And he goes into partnership with more people, and as a result, they actually reopen almost all of these mines under one big company that is called the Imperious Mining Company because he finds a guy that's willing to go the distance with him. And his name is Herman Imperious. He's been the former mayor of Alamosa. And between the two of them, they build a modern day mining enterprise that will carry their operations into the 1950s and 60s. And as a result, Creed keeps going in spite of the fact that silver has dropped from right around 90 cents an ounce from uh, 1890 down to 60 some odd cents in 1893. And there's no going back on that drop in, in silver. This is done by the federal government. Um, they are reacting to the British. And the British have a large mint in India where they are turning out the English equivalent of the American dollar and using it for international trade. And every time they buy some silver to run it through as coins, the values change and the price of silver drops or whatever. And the British in early 1893 say, fooey on this. And they shut down the mint. It stays shut down for five years. And when they shut it down, that means that the demand has dropped worldwide. And so the US prices for silver for what is actually being paid by the federal government versus what the market is showing for the price of silver is now way out of proportion. And the US government, when uh, Robert Cleveland assumes office, says, we don't think we're going to do this either. And they um, only mint 100,000 coins at the San Francisco Mint, that one, 100,000 silver dollars at the San Francisco Mint, and it's only for two months. And when they pull that out of the market, then the silver market really crashes. It did not fall by half overnight. It was a stair-step <coughs> process down. So that combined with the new processing technique still allows Creed to maintain something. And then there still is one more feature, and that is there's a lot of lead and zinc in these ores. And there's a market there. It's just that it is something that sells by the pound and by the ton, not by the ounce. But if you produce enough of it, and if you get your actual processes up to where you are producing enough of the stuff, you can still make money. So here is the Commodore 5 level. 
they call it a tunnel, it's an attic that goes absolutely parallel to the Nelson Tunnel all the way back. A.E. Reynolds has duplicated the effort. And this is the ruins of the imperious mill where they processed these ores, uh, greatly reduced in the amount of silver, but lead and zinc are helping to carry their weight. And it's all on the amethyst vein. And this specimen, which was featured in some of the handouts that we've got over here uh, for the museum, is a vug, an opening in the rock that is filled with amethyst crystals. Um, incredibly colorful stuff even today. And the minerals don't have the chlorargyrite and the wire silver in them. Instead, it's lead ore and zinc ore. This sort of golden brown stuff is the mineral sphalerite, zinc sulfide. The silvery stuff is galena, which is lead sulfide. And those are the two main ore minerals for lead and zinc. And that is what is now being mined at Creed all the way from the 20s to the 30s to the 40s to the 50s. There is minor silver that's in there. And there will be again at some point in time, but not yet. These are big, big Galena crystals uh, from the amethyst vein. And that's actually from the amethyst mine. And this is Jimmy Sphalerite. You actually can cut it into a gemstone. You might be sorry because it has an excellent cleavage and it's really not very hard. And so you don't want to put it in a ring or something that you might bash on the countertop. But it, it can be a beautiful stone that you could put in a pendant where one time a year maybe. Um, this is the mineral chalcopyrite, which is copper, iron, and sulfur on the sphalerite, the zinc sulfide. These are all large specimens. This thing's bigger than your fist, and these are all on display in the museum. Um, this is another one of chalcopyrite, and again on um, the sphalerite. Uh, that plate's probably six or seven inches across. And this was the mainstay at Creed during these years. And then in the 1930s, about 1935 or 36, it's not, there, there are people that still argue about the exact year. At depth in the amethyst vein, they found another vein that was buried, it was concealed, it didn't prop out on the surface. It was called the OH, and then a few years later they found one that was parallel to it, uh, and that was called the P-Vein. And that turned out to be a truly bonanza um, ore body and then ore bodies for the Commodore mine and the Amethyst mine that allowed them to operate at a profit, still not millions and millions of dollars worth of silver, but nonetheless it provided jobs for the local miners, it provided fodder for the Leadville smelters, and it helped educate the kids, and the school kids grew up with a feeling for the mines, for the hillside that they wouldn't have gotten if they had to move to the slums of Denver because the mines had shut down. Um, Morris Valerite, quite Jimmy, um, and that is from the OH vein, and in the P vein it's really quite distinctive um, that greenish color is that same mineral, zinc sulfide. Um, some of this stuff has been faceted and it's absolutely beautiful material. So, that is the end of part one of the Creed story. And I have purposely skipped over or around the thing that's actually mentioned on this little chart. And that is that I basically cut out everything after 1966. In 
60, in 66, there was another vein that was discovered, the Bachelor, and we'll pick that up next time because that deals directly with the geology. It's not unique to Creed, but it certainly makes the Creed story a unique story. And we, we'll begin there. But the point is that from 1891 to 1966, you're talking about almost 60 million ounces of silver. Value at time mined was only 39 million. Um, and there certainly were lead values and zinc values over 100,000 tons of lead. Um, and almost 40,000 tons of zinc that were mined and not very much copper but enough to throw another million dollars into the mix. So that's the end of this part. I hope that you'll show up next time and I'll guarantee you I will start you off in a place that you won't believe after hearing this one. It'll be <laughs> an, an entirely different chapter to the whole story. Thank you very much.